Nice to see that Fergus Falls is no different than anywhere else in Minnesota. Everyone sits as far back as they can from the pulpit. So. Pastor, are you, guys, are you guys going to Israel with uh, another Calvary group, or who are you going with? Oh, it is. Okay. All right. Well, praise God. Yes. Amen. Who knows what's happening these days? So, uh, just very briefly um, about myself. So, again, uh, my name is Trevor Rubenstein. I was born into a conservative Jewish home in northern Minnesota, in Virginia, Minnesota, actually. Um, and there was a decent-sized Jewish population up there, um, actually up until the time I was a young man, um, because when Jewish people were immigrating from Eastern Europe, they often went to places when they came to America that were economically thriving, and the Iron Range was a booming community economically at that point in time, so if you wanted to establish businesses to where your family could integrate well, it was a wonderful community to do that. Is there, is there a Jewish community here at all? Is there a synagogue in town, do you guys know? No, there isn't. Okay. Uh, and uh, and so uh, over the years, really, the Jewish people moved largely into the larger cities. Um, and my family eventually did, too. Uh, so they left northern Minnesota, and we moved to Littleton, Colorado. Um, I was a troubled kid. I come from actually a very successful family. Um, are you guys familiar with Gumby, the Gumby toy? So my grandfather invented the Gumby toy, and... Uh, and Barrel of Monkeys was his. If you guys have ever played Sequence, that's a family business, right? Um, very successful family, and, uh, and I was heading in very much a different direction. I spent most of my youth as an unprescribed pharmaceutical test engineer, and, uh, and it, it went about as well as you would expect. And so as a young man, um, really suffering from being depressed and suicidal and things of that nature, um, I, uh, I eventually was even kicked out of school uh, because of my uh, abuse of different things. And, uh, and then I got into a local community college, in which case I, I was tricked into a Bible study by a cult. And I, and I say tricked because uh, as a Jewish person, even though I did not believe in God, I was raised in what is called conservative Judaism, which means conserve the traditions of your ancestors. And the one thing that would not have been acceptable for me that I was raised in, and, and most Jewish people are raised in such a way to where they understand this, that you can kind of believe or not believe in anything except you cannot believe in Jesus. And so if I understood that this is what I was being invited to, not that the individual was intentionally being deceptive, I just didn't hear what he was inviting me to, um, there's no way I would have participated. But so we went to this thing, and he had us open up Bibles to Luke chapter 15. It's a story called The Parable of the Prodigal Son. It's a story of an individual, who, a child who takes his father's inheritance that he was going to receive early, and he goes and he squanders it in sinful living, and he ends up becoming impoverished. And so he remembers that even the slaves in his father's home were living better than he was. So he returns to his father's home, not to be a, uh, not to really be um, back in his old position, but to be a servant, to be a slave to him. But his father said, you're not a slave, you're my son, and he embraces him and he receives him. So this is a powerful story of reconciliation. Really, it's a powerful story of, of sin leading to destructive behavior and separating us from God. But yet, if we come repentant before the Lord because of the sacrifice that he made on the part of Jesus, that then we can be reconciled to him. And it's this beautiful imagery of that. But the, the words meant nothing to me. Um, but what I... What I wasn't expecting was the first time that I ever read the words of Jesus was the first time I ever felt the presence of God. And, and I had gone through different Jewish rituals and things previously. I had a bar mitzvah. Uh, it's a celebration of becoming a man. Really, it's responsible for your own actions within Judaism, something you do at 13 years old. Honestly, I did it for the money. Um, you get a good payday. But, uh, and, and unfortunately, that supplied me in a lot of the things I was doing that was abusive. Um, but, but uh, so I had that background, but I never really received the presence of God. You see, for a Jewish person also, we, when we read, uh, at least in conservative and orthodox Judaism, when you read the scriptures, you read it in Hebrew. And, and so I learned how to, how to read and write Hebrew, but I never understood what it meant. 
So you could recite the things, you could say the things in a way, uh, it, but, but you, didn't, you weren't taking in, you weren't comprehending. Much like the Catholic Church, how they spoke in Latin for many, many years uh, amongst people who didn't understand the Latin language. Uh, but uh, this was the first time I read the words where I could comprehend them, and uh, I became overwhelmed by the presence of God. And so three things became very real to me. One, the first thing was God, because I didn't even believe he existed. And so I was this depressed, suicidal person reading these words of something I had no interest in that I thought were useless and foolishness, and all of a sudden I feel the presence of God. And, and, and I can explain it in the next two things that were revealed what that was like, because one thing that became very real to me was that everything I was doing was separating me from God. So one of the things that I clearly felt was an incredible conviction over my sin, just immediately. And then, right after that, something that was greater than that conviction of sin was a desire I could feel that God wanted me to be reconciled to him, and I knew that the only way that I could do this was through Jesus. I immediately dismissed this, and so I tried, I tried distancing myself from what I experienced, but in a hard time, I gave my life to Jesus, and, and he literally saved my life. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. I was actively pursuing ending it. And, and so I, I, li I owe my life in a very literal sense to the Lord, but beyond that, I owe my eternity to him also. And so my goal and my focus from that point forward really became reaching people with the good news of Jesus. And so I, I reached out to people that I really understood and, and people that I could uh, work with. And so I worked in drug and alcohol rehab for years and I've, I've actually done a lot of work in cults. Um, I've, I, I maybe, I don't know how many Jewish people have ever gone to a mosque to preach Jesus, but I've done this, right? And, and so... Uh, and so I really had a heart for the lost, for people that didn't know Jesus, because he's the difference between life and death. And I mean that sincerely. And, and so uh, most recently, I'm so blessed, and I work for an organization called Chosen People Ministries. And Chosen People Ministries works for uh, something that has been really part of my heart, because you see, I have a wonderful family. And, and I was the first person in that family for over the last 2,000 years who has believed in Jesus as the promised Messiah. Uh, so many of you, may, when, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus and you depart from this plane of existence and you go to be with the Lord, you'll see some of your ancestors. I won't. And so this really became burdensome to me and my desire to reach the Jewish people is something that I focus on. And so if you guys want to know more about what we do specifically, you can grab one of my brochures back there. I am the Minnesota represent, representative for this organization. You guys are technically in my territory, and but with the overwhelming Jewish population, as you guys explained to me that you have here, you probably won't see me often. Um, but, uh, but I'm always blessed to be here and to, and to be with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, and it's just a wonderful opportunity. And you see our organization, the, uh, our mission statement is to evangelize, disciple, serve, pray for Jewish people everywhere, and to help fellow believers do the same. And actually, we're the oldest organization in America to do this. We started in the 1800s, and actually the oldest branch of that organization is here in Minnesota. Yeah, so we have a fascinating history for Jewish outreach. What I want to talk about today is actually the history of Jewish evangelism. This will actually help us understand why Israel, why does it matter? What's the importance of Israel? It will also help us to understand um, why anti-Semitism, what's happening. Uh, fascinating that all those things can be grasped, I think, largely through studying Jewish evangelism. Paul, in his book called Romans, it's an epistle in which he wrote to the church of Rome. It's really seen as Paul's doctrinal statement, really where he's setting up the foundations of the Christian faith. And, and in chapter 1, verse 16, he makes this fascinating statement. He says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is a very important statement, and it's often overlooked within church history, but there's a significance to why to the Jew first. You see, because God initially reveals himself 
to the people of Israel. He makes a promise to an individual named Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. This promise then passes down to Isaac and then to Jacob. And Jacob has 12 boys. And these boys become the forefathers of the nation of Israel. And God brings them out of their captivity in Egypt into the promised land. And when he does this, God knows that Israel is going to reject him in time. And he actually prophesies this. So we read in the Hebrew scriptures about God's plan for salvation to the world. And we read about this prophetically as Moses is bringing this people out of Egypt into the promised land for what will occur. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21, Moses is singing a song. And he sings this song. And in part of the song, he's speaking about Israel. And this is God's perspective towards Israel. And it says this, They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by a foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. And I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. This is what God says. As Israel goes after other gods, I will go to other people. And this was established very much in the beginning of the faith tradition in which we follow. The... In Jeremiah, this is the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah, who is his Hebrew name? Jeremiah in chapter 31, there's a prophecy about a new covenant that God was going to bring forth. You guys should be familiar with the new covenant. The new covenant is the covenant that is offered through Jesus, through his atoning work, where because of our sin, we separate ourselves from God, and the result of that is death, and so God sends his son to die for us us so that then we can be reconciled to him and have eternal life. This is the new covenant. When we read about the new covenant, it was prophesied in the Hebrew scriptures. And it starts here in Jeremiah chapter 31. And let's look at starting in verse 31, where it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So I want you to notice that. Who is the new covenant for? Israel and Judah. That's who it's for. The atoning work of Jesus is intended for Israel and Judah. goes on in verse 32 and says, My covenant which they broke, right? So he talks about the, the previous covenant which they broke, but there's going to be a new one, so not like that one. Verse 33, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. What this is referring to prophetically is previously people would just know the instructions of God through what they would read or what they would hear, right? As people would tell them what the instructions were. But he says that something different's going to happen where you will know the instructions of God inside you. This occurs when we come to faith and the Lord sends his Holy Spirit upon you. So this is prophesying about the Holy Spirit. Verse 34 says, No one, excuse me, uh, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, for, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So, how does God deal with sin? This is talking about Jesus, clearly. And it's prophetically talking about what Jesus was going to do. But if we look further into this section of Scripture, this new covenant, look at what God promises with this new covenant. Look at this in verse 35 and 36. It says this, Thus says the Lord, who gives sun for light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Look what he goes on and says, if those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Listen to this fascinating statement. This is what God's saying. It's part of the new covenant, okay? Part of the covenant that Jesus brings in. He says, if the sun stops shining and the moon and the stars are no longer in the sky, or if the sea no longer has waves, only then will Israel stop being a nation before God. 
This is what he says. And you see, when we come to the time of the new covenant, after Jesus comes onto the scene, the promised Messiah is born. In Matthew chapter 15, we have this interesting interaction between Jesus and a Gentile, a non-Jewish woman. But remember, the new covenant is for Israel and Judah. And so let's look at what happens here. It says this in verse 22. It says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him and said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And look at what Jesus answers in verse 24. It says, But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Because who's the new covenant for? For Israel. Not for the Gentiles, not for anyone that is outside of Israel or the nations. But look at her answer. Her answer is very telling in verse 26. But he answered and said, is it, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. So here's what she says. Here's, here's how it works. If I have a gift and I want to give you a gift and you say, no, you don't want it, then it becomes available to you. And this is how the gospel went from Israel to the nations. How many people here are not Jewish in their ancestry as far as they know? Yeah. So, really, you can thank your salvation, as we'll see in, de in more depth, to the rejection of the gospel by Israel. And we'll see very clearly. This is, this is elaborated on as we continue through the scriptures. So, if we continue... Let's go past here. This is kind of interesting, actually. I want, to, I want to point this out briefly, and I don't have to read the text here, but if you're interested in Galatians chapter 2 that it's spoken of, actually. Did you know that there's two types of big A apostles? You guys ever hear of this? So the, the apostles, there's, there's the big apostles, the 12, right? And, and of course, one of them betrays the Lord, and then he is eventually replaced, and then uh, eventually Paul is added. So technically there's, there's 13, but, but of these big apostles, there's two types, and, and Paul talks about this here. He, actually, there's apostles to the Jews, and there's apostles to the Gentiles. So some apostles went to the Jewish people, and some apostles went to the nations. Paul says he's an apostle to the uncircumcised, to the nations. And you'll see this actually when you read the epistles. James, for example, is an apostle to the Jews. And in the introduction to the gospel of James, he says, to the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad. He's talking to Jewish people, Jewish believers in Jesus. That, that's his audience. But Paul's primary focus of ministry is reaching Gentiles, reaching the nations. So if your focus was to reach Gentiles, what would be your approach to evangelism? What would be the thing that you would do? The first place you would go. If you're trying to reach non-Jewish people, where would you go first? The synagogue, right? Makes no sense. The synagogue is the place that the Jewish people worship. But this is Paul's method of evangelism. Watch this. Let's look at this. So you see this every time, without exception. Every time Paul, the evangelist to the Gentiles, goes anywhere, the first place he goes is to the synagogue, the place where the Jewish people are watching. Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. It says this, They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went in to, into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, but a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. So, so this is what happens. So Paul, he's an evangelist to the Gentiles. What he does is he goes and he preaches in the synagogues and then he is rejected 
by the Jewish people and a bunch of Gentiles get saved. This is his method for evangelism. Why? Because as we just said, that what the scripture sets up is this precedent that states, if you don't want it, then it goes to you. Let's listen to this. Just very briefly, I'm going to read this. It's not in my text. It's not in my PowerPoint here. But this is in Acts chapter 13, verse 46. After Paul is rejected by the Jewish community, look at what he says. It says, Then Paul and Barnabas, who also was an apostle to the Jew, Jews, or Gentiles, by the way, grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. He's speaking to the Jewish people. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? Jewish rejection leads to Gentile salvation. This is how the gospel was established in Scripture. In Acts chapter 21, I want us to see something. So this is just very brief. And so we can kind of understand what's happening today and what's happened historically. In Acts chapter 21, there was actually a movement that was going on where many Jewish people were coming to faith in Jesus. So early in the church, is around 50 or so in the common era, what was happening was Jewish people were coming to believe in large numbers. In Acts chapter 21, verse 20, James says, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads, this is a word for tens of thousands of Jews there are who have believed, and they are zealous for the law. It's estimated that this could possibly be up to an eighth of the population of Jerusalem. So actually, there was a movement going on in Jerusalem at Paul's time where many Jewish people were coming to faith. This becomes incredibly significant. I'll show you. We'll, we'll see why as we continue with this. But something that I wanted you to see uh, what occurred as a result of this is right after all of these Jewish people came to faith is Rome came in and decimated Jerusalem and killed the movement entirely. So there were many Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus, and then Rome comes in, they destroy the temple, they kill a million Jewish people, take a 100,000 more captive, and destroy the movement. This is historically, unfortunately, what happens. In church history, there have been efforts to reach the Jewish community. It's a book actually written by Justin Martyr. It's called The Dialogue with Trifo, which is really an example of a Gentile person sharing Jesus with Jewish people. But unfortunately, historically, it was unsuccessful, a lot of the efforts to reach Jewish people. But uh, part, part of the reason that it was unsuccessful is because Christians did a horrible job of representing who Jesus is to the Jewish people. You see, in my house, as well as a lot of other Jewish homes, Jesus Christ is an acceptable curse word. Why? Uh, it's actually because of Christians. Because unfortunately, the Jewish people, when they lived in Europe, what happened was Jewish people were hated, rejected, persecuted, and killed for not being Christian. So the Jesus that we were introduced to, that most Jewish people were introduced to, they were introduced to at the end of a sword or a gun, and they were told, believe or die. And this was our history. This is the history of the Jewish people. Uh, unfortunately, so, so the Jesus that we were introduced to is not the Jesus of the Scriptures, but we were actually introduced to a Jesus that was from the state churches of Europe saying that you convert or you die. And so many Jewish people saw him not as their Savior, but the reason for their suffering. And uh, this, unfortunately, was much the history. Uh, even Martin Luther who started out actually seeing this and understanding this, this is a quote from Martin Luther, became vehemently anti-Semitic at the end of his life. Look at what he says early. He says, if we really want to help them, we must be guided in our dwellings with them, speaking towards Jewish people, not by papal law, but by the law of Christian love. We must receive them cordially and permit them to trade and work with us, hear our Christian teachings, and witness our Christian life. If some of them should prove stiff-necked, what of it? After all, we ourselves are not all good Christians either. We are even at fault in not avenging all... Or, yeah, and then he goes on and he says this. This is his change of heart towards the end of his life. He says this. 
We're even not a fault in not avenging all this innocent blood out of our Lord and of, and of the Christians, which they shed for 300 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. And the blood of the children they have shed since then, we are at fault in not slaying them. Martin Luther, actually, who started off saying, well, look, at we've been horrible witnesses. He, he, at the end of his life, says we should kill all the Jews. Actually, did you guys know that the uh, justification for the Holocaust was Martin Luther? Martin Luther, because what they did was they took Martin Luther's writings and they said, uh, that Hitler did, and he said, look at, Luther told us to kill the Jews. So let's kill them. This is, this is the history. This is what the Jewish people were exposed to throughout their time in Europe. It wasn't just from the Catholics, it was also from the Protestants. Uh, but there, were, were they true regenerate believers? I have a hard time believing that. But of course, it was a state church thing. It was people that just grew up in a tradition without a true faith in Jesus. They were just following this because they thought that they were supposed to, and they were told that Jews were evil. So they killed them. Okay? This was never God's intention. Actually, who's, who's responsible for the death of Jesus? Who? Yeah, absolutely everybody. And, and Jesus says, Jesus is responsible. He says, no one takes my life. I lay down my own life. And if you're a sinner, you're responsible for the death of Jesus. Do you know what the percentage is of sinners in America? High. Yeah, high is right. 100%. Jesus died for your sins. It's not that the Jewish people killed him apart from his will. And hey, actually, God even set it up. And Paul, excuse me, and Peter says this where it was a Jewish court that condemned him, but it was also a Gentile court. It was the Romans. He actually dies by Roman crucifixion. Because the Jewish people handed him over, and then Rome deemed him to be killed. So he died by everybody for everybody. But unfortunately, the church ended up blaming the Jewish people and treating them horribly. And as I said, that led to the Holocaust. But, but previous to the Holocaust, this is interesting. I want us to understand this in context for what's happening in the world. Is uh, the guy the guy that's the president of the organization I work for? His name is Mitch Glazier, and he did in his dissertation he did a work where he was studying what was happening with faith in Jesus amongst Jewish people in Europe. And in the 1920s and 1930s, going into the 40s, he found that there was a massive movement of Jewish people coming to believe in Jesus in Europe, about 250,000, massive movement. So all of these Jewish people start believing, and then the Holocaust comes and wipes it out. They killed all of them, just like what we saw in 70 AD. So we see this pattern, this unfortunate pattern, actually. Uh, we see a pattern to where whenever there's a lot of Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus, the enemy comes in, he stirs something up and wipes out a bunch of Jewish people. Uh, we'll, we'll see why here in a second. I want to point this out. So in modern history, actually, there's been some, uh, some wonderful efforts to reach Jewish people in new ways, in effective ways. Uh, the, there's an organization that was called the Church's Ministry Amongst the Jews. It was started in 1809. And this was an organization that, uh, that amongst the board was Charles Simeon, one of the, uh, just a premier uh, minister in England, and also an individual by the name of William Wilberforce. You guys familiar with who William Wilberforce is? Yeah, so William Wilberforce is foundational in abolishing slavery in, in England and then eventually in America. Uh, and he was part of the founders of this organization to reach the Jewish people, the first real modern effort to reach Jewish people in a new way, in a way that didn't say convert or die. And the, the organization, what they did was they would declare the Messiahship of Jesus to the Jews first and also to the non-Jew. They endeavored to teach the church its Jewish origins, its Jewish heritage, they would encourage the physical restoration of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, and they'd encourage Hebrew Christian or Messianic Jewish congregations, the movement in which Jewish people could worship in a very Jewish way. And this was established in England. Eventually it was followed in America by an organization that I used to run here in Minnesota called the Zion Society, or Good News for Israel. Uh, and and uh, eventually we merged with the organization called the American Mission to the Jews, which becomes Chosen People Ministries. Both started in the 1800s here, but were directly affected out of this heart because when people read the Bible, they saw that God loves the Jewish people and wants to reach them with the gospel. You guys ever read the Great 
Commission, the section that talks about the Great Commission? Do you know where it starts? Jerusalem. Who lives there? Jews. The, the, the mission field for the church, it starts there. Right? And so they saw that and they would start working for it. There's an organization called Jews for Jesus, which is more well known than us because they're very good at marketing. But they actually broke off from our organization in the 1970s. And let's go to this slide. But I want to show you something that we see that's happening today. So we did some polling. This was kind of a shock to all of us. We did some polling in 2017. And when we did, when we did polling in 2017, this was actually a poll that was done by Lifeway Research. And they asked, uh, they asked actually uh, about people that had faith in Jesus, people that, att- or that, uh, that had evangelical beliefs, right? Standard step-by-step evangelical beliefs. You know, uh, Jesus uh, is the, excuse me, Jesus is the Son of God, right? Part of a triune God. He, came, he was born of a virgin. He came, he died for our sins. He rose again from the dead. We are saved by faith in him alone. These type of beliefs. We checked and saw what percentage of Americans have these beliefs, and, and, and we happen to ask the question as to what percentage of these people are Jewish. And when we found this, we actually found that in America today, or in 2017, that of these people that were really attending evangelical churches, that have evangelical beliefs, uh, that 870,000 of them were Jewish people in America. 250,000 was a massive number in Europe of Jewish people that believed previous to the Holocaust. What we found in America is 870,000 of them prescribing to evangelical beliefs. This is actually from Pew Research. I don't remember if this is 2019 or 2020, one or the other. But on the far left side, on the far left side there, do do I have a laser? That would be cool. I don't think I do. On the far left side, they break down Jewish people and Jewish faith. And on the left side, you'll see how many of the Jewish people in America consider themselves Jewish by religion today. And that's 68%. How many of them don't consider themselves Jewish today is 32%. And how many of those 32% consider themselves Christian in America? It's 19% of the American Jewish population considers themselves Christian today. This is massive. There are more Jewish people that believe in Jesus today in America than there were for the previous, excuse me, if you go back probably about uh, 60 years, than the previous 1900 years before that, if you added up every Jewish person that came to faith, it does not add up to the amount that are alive today. Not even close. We've actually seen a massive movement of Jewish people coming to faith, particularly in America. Interestingly, we've also seen a massive increase of anti-Semitism. Massive. We've seen this pattern. Because the pattern is, Jewish people start coming to faith, and something horrible comes in and wipes them out. Actually, I met with a pastor at a large church. I think they're considered a mega church in uh, in Minnesota in um, late September, and I told him about this pattern that we see. And I said, I expect something horrible to start to happen to Jewish people in America if this pattern continues. And then October se- uh, October seventh happened a few weeks later, and uh, and then we saw this increase of anti-Semitism kind of explode. Fascinating. And, and, and it wasn't, I'm not prophetic. I'm really not. Ask my wife. But I it just simply saw what happened. So why, right? What's, what's happening here? What, what does this mean? This, is, this was actually our building. Um, there's a swastika. We have a building in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. That's where our home is. There's a swastika written on there. It says Goy was here. Really, the it's it's a there's an organization called the Goyim Defense League that talks about how we're going to save the world against the evil and wicked Jews. Let me point this out just very quickly, just so we understand biblically. Biblically, is there anything in Scripture, past 
or prophecy future that says that the Jews are going to take over the world and oppress the people. No, never. But how often does the Scripture say that the nations are going to oppress the Jews? Over and over and over and over. You have actually moved into non-biblical, anti-Semitic heresy when you start thinking that the Jews are trying to take over the world. It's not what the Scripture says will happen at all, at no time. If anybody can show me the prophecy where it says that that will happen, I'd tell you I'd give you something, but I really don't have much. But it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And, and so the, the, the narrative, the false narrative about the Jewish people are, are taking over and they're wicked and they're, they're doing this and they're doing... There's many wicked Jewish people just like there's wicked anybody. They all need Jesus, right? That's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in. But if we continue here, I want us to look at this very quickly. Because the Lord tells us about, just that bottom verse is what I want to focus on. The Lord tells us about what's going to happen, really, that brings forth kind of the end of things, okay? So when you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, it says this. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. This is an interesting statement, okay? So this is what, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 14. He says that first the gospel has to go throughout all the nations, uh, Paul will really start to elaborate on this for us uh, and he'll give us a deeper understanding. But, but look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 through 39 about his return. Jesus says when he's going to come back. This is a fascinating section of Scripture. Jesus tells us when he's coming back. Isn't that interesting? And, and look at what he says. This is the scenario. He says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 through 39. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, Jewish Jerusalem, that's who he's talking to very clearly, the Jewish people living in Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Every instance, by the way, every instance that we see about Jesus coming back, he comes back where? Jerusalem. And do you know who's there when he comes back? Jewish people. Why do you think there's a fight against having Jewish people living in Jerusalem today? Because if he's not there, prophecy can't be fulfilled. Jesus isn't coming back. But look what he says. We'll bring him back. Look at this. He says this, Jewish Jerusalem... He says, for I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai. It's a Hebrew idiom. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It says, I'm not coming back until you welcome me. Isn't that interesting? So whenever we see an uptick of Jewish faith, we see the enemy wipe it out. Let's continue. Here's another example of the return of Jesus. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Jerusalem is surrounded by foreign armies about to get wiped out. God intervenes miraculously. And this is what it says happens. And I will pour on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is God speaking, by the way. The spirit of grace and supplication. This is written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. And it says, they will look on me whom they pierced. Who's God who is pierced? Jesus. This is written hundreds of years before his birth. Okay? But it's God says that Jerusalem is going to look upon him who they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. This is language of repentance. So who's going to repent? Upon the pierced one coming back. Let's look. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem, says like the morning Hadad Ramon. It says, And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, and the children by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and the wives and the children, the family of the house of Levi, the family of the house of Shemai, and all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. So who's repenting when Jesus returns? The Jewish people, they're crying out to Jesus and he returns every instance. 
So let's look at what Paul says about this in Romans chapter 11. Because people say, well, God's done with the Jews. They rejected Jesus, so he's done with them, right? And by the way, there's only one way to salvation. That's why I do what I do for work. It's, It's only through Jesus. He's the only one that can offer eternal life. It's putting your faith and trust in him. But God does works in different people at different times. This is called dispensationalism. And in Calvary Chapel, Calvary Chapel is dispensational in their eschatology. It means God's working through different people in different ways through different times. And currently, he's working primarily through the nations. But that's why Paul asked this question in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. He says, I say then, has God cast away his people, speaking of Israel? Certainly not, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, I'm evidence that God's not done with the Jewish people. Right? That's what Paul's saying. But verse 11 starts to talk about then what's happening in the world today and what does this mean? Look at this. I say then, have they, meaning Israel, stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? Like I said, you're saved because they rejected the gospel. Because it was their gift. And when they reject it, it's available to you. But look what he goes on and says. Now, if their fall means riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Uh, Really pay attention to this. This is what Paul's saying. So when Israel rejects the gospel, if that means that saving faith, eternal life then, becomes offered to all the nations of the world to where anyone who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior can be saved, if their rejection means salvation to the world, then when they accept it, it's bigger than that. Bigger than salvation to the world. What's bigger than salvation to the world? Uh, People having an opportunity to become saved. Verse 15, he says, For if they're being cast away, Israel's cast away as the reconciling of the world. Remember, you don't want it. It's available to you. Israel rejects it. It's available to all the nations. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He's talking about the resurrection. Because you see... Jesus says he's not coming back till his people cry out to him. So if you wonder why we're seeing a massive increase of anti-Semitism in America today, spiritually it makes all the sense in the world. All the sense in the world. Because the enemy is fighting against the return of our Lord. God will use it for good. He always does. But this is what begins to make sense spiritually. The world doesn't know why it does what it does. It's just doing it. But look at, look at what uh, Paul goes on and says. And this is a fascinating thing. Because it's probably the first time any of you have heard this. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe pastors spoke on these things before. But, but it's probably the first time many of you, I would guess, have heard some of this. Uh, but, but look at what Paul says about this very topic. Look what he says. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. And the church is ignorant of this. But but look what he goes on and says. Lest you become wise in your own opinion. Because what was happening is the church became arrogant against the Jews. As opposed to being grateful to the Jewish people. Their rejection means we can be saved. said, why are they stupid Jews not, not believing this? That was the church's attitude. Horrific. And so instead of having a deep desire to reach them, they condemn them. So don't become wise in your own opinion. This is what he actually says earlier in this chapter. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Until the gospel goes throughout all the nations. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So what happens is at the very end there's a national turning of Israel to God, to Jesus. They will be saved. Future tense. Not that they are. You still need to accept Jesus. But there's a time and a place to where they turn entirely and they turn to Jesus. And so really, 
if you are looking for, and so we, we kind of, I think, have an understanding, you know, why are the Jewish people hated? Well, they're hated because they're so successful. No, when they were the poorest people, they were still hated and persecuted and killed. Oh, well, they're, they're, they're hated because, uh, because they're different. No, no, when they completely acclimate, they're still hated and gathered up and killed. You only had to be 25% Jewish to go to the concentration camps. It didn't matter what you believed or practiced. Uh, well, you know, it's the left. The left hates them. No, actually, the right is hating them too. The, the alt-right's propagating that the Jews are responsible for all the problems because they blame Jews, the Rothschilds, and, the, and the, you know, all the conspiracies are done by Sor George Soros and, and all the people. This is interesting. You'll notice this if you really focus on it. All the conspiratorial things that teach that these guys are the reasons for the problems in the world, you'll notice almost all of them are always Jewish. I'm not saying that they're good people. But why do we only focus on the Jews? Because the, what happens is the anti-Semitism comes from di both directions. It's actually growing tremendously. There's, there's actually major political conservative figures uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also um, media figures that are now attacking Israel and attacking the Jews. It's, it's, it's not just them and us. It's everywhere. It's anyone who does not put their faith and trust in Jesus is susceptible. Because without question, actually when you look at this, either historically or prophetically, God always judges the nations based on how they treat Israel. Without exception in Scripture. Both in the past, starting with Egypt, where Pharaoh mistreated the Jews and so God judged them. Looking to the future, to Gog and Magog, he judges them because they come against Israel. Always, without exception. Why? Because God has a plan with these people. But you don't understand. They're difficult. Oh, I understand. It, 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 the, mo the most frustrating mission field in the world, I promise you, is reaching Jewish people. Why? Because there's a spiritual blindness. Why is that spiritual blindness there? So you can be saved. This is the mission field and this is what's happening. So practically, what can we do? Well, the scripture is very clear that we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. How does peace ever come to Jerusalem when they turn to Jesus? Other, other things that we can do. Actually, there's ways to contribute to ministries that are doing wonderful work to reach Jewish people with the gospel. Actually, I think my, I think my new friend Isaac there works for one of these ministries too. Uh, and, and there's, there's one, organizations like ours, like Chosen People Ministries. We, we do things to help reach Jewish people with the gospel in Israel today. We're gathering up supplies and delivering them to soldiers and distributing food to the needy. And, and uh, we're ministering to people, Holocaust survivors that are re-going through amazing trauma. Again, we're able to help people in need. We're doing children's programs for parents that are away fighting. I mean, there's a lot of good work that our organization's doing and you guys can contribute to that and that's wonderful. There's other wonderful organizations like Vision for Israel that are doing amazing work in Israel. Let, let, me, let me just ask you this. Please, 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 if you're going to give to work that's done to, re, uh, to, uh, to minister to Jewish people in this time, only give to Christian organizations. Do not give to Jewish organizations that oppose the gospel because the only hope for anybody is the gospel. My wife always says, are you going to send them to hell with a full stomach? And so please give to those organizations. There's organizations that claim to be, and I don't want to name them specifically, but it claim to be fellowships of Christians and Jews, and they're not. That one that has that name in particular. They're not. They're Jewish. They might do some very kind things for people, but they refuse to share the gospel. So there's ways that we can do that. We can pray. But you know what the best thing that you can do? The best thing that you can do, bar none, to both oppose anti-Semitism and to further the kingdom of God is to share Jesus. That's the best thing you can do. Is you can go and you can share Jesus with somebody. Radical Muslims who hate Jewish people, who want them dead, come to faith in Jesus, and all of a sudden they love the Jews. Because the solution is the gospel. It's the changed heart of Jesus that he does within us. Uh, by the way, you want to see abortion end? Share the gospel. Actually, in, in Rome, before the expansion of Christianity, the Roman Empire was, it was prevalent throughout the Roman Empire to kill 
pre- or newly born children. But when more and more people became believers in Jesus, that changed in the culture. You want to see sexual immorality go away? Share Jesus. In the Roman Empire, it was very common for men to have relations with little boys. But once Christianity spread, it went away. It wasn't done through some type of massive political effort. It was actually done mostly through sharing Jesus with other people. So how do we do that? Well, it's very simple. Very, very simple. You can invite people to church where they can hear the gospel. You can pray for them. You can support missionaries. By the way, I'm a, I'm a fundraised, supported missionary, and I would tell you, uh, do not give to me if you're willing to give to somebody else, but give to somebody that's sharing the gospel. Because it needs to be spread in these times. If you wonder what's wrong with our country, it's that we are becoming less and less of a Christian nation. What's the solution to that? Share Jesus with non-believers. It changes everybody. It changes the world. And it's how we end anti-Semitism. It's we share Jesus with the Jew and the non-Jew. The, the, the more I'm the most loved Jewish person I know because Christians love me. Because they're my brothers and sisters and because they, they love the Jewish people because they read the Word of God. But it's the Holy Spirit that did the work in them. It's not, it wasn't done politically. It was done through changed hearts internally. And it's truly the best thing that we can do. Let's pray. Abba, Father, Lord, we thank you, God. We praise your holy name. God, I thank you for this church, Father. For this group of people, Lord, who you have called together, Father, for such a time as this. Father, I ask, God, that you supernaturally empower them, Father. That you give them the wisdom, the things to say, Father. That you, Father, make it clear in their hearts and their minds for how to share the truth of Jesus with the lost and hurting world, God. Father, that our sins separated us from you and led to death, but you sent your Son to take that punishment upon us, God. Father, so that then we who put our faith and trust in the work of Jesus can then be reconciled to you and have eternal life. God, Father, we ask, Lord, Father, that you make that so true to us that it be upon our lips and our tongues, God. Father, as we share with others, Father, but led by your Spirit, God, Father, you fill us with the wisdom of the words that we need, Lord. God, we ask for open doors for each of us, Father, to be able to invite people to church, God, to be able to share your truth with them, Lord. Father, and God, we pray, Father, we pray for our lost loved ones, Lord, that your spirit would do a work in their heart even now, God, for we know that it's not us that does any of the work, God, but it's you that does the work in them, God, Father, we just present them with the truth. We just are making an introduction, God. And so, Lord, we ask for those opportunities. Father, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem, God. Lord, we ask that you continue, Father, this massive move that you are doing amongst the Jewish people, Lord. Father, allowing them to come to know you, Father. Lord, so that, Father, if... And when each and every one of us passes away, Lord, that they will be able to spend eternity with you, God. But Father, in the midst of their trial and the heartache and the difficult things going on, God, Lord, we ask, Father, that you touch more and more people, Father, with an understanding that they need a Savior, that they need Jesus, God. Father, utilize difficult times to bring people to faith, God. Father, we pray for the, for the Palestinian people, Father, God, that under the suffering that they have, Lord, that they will turn away from Islam that offers them no solution and instead will turn to Jesus, God. Father, we ask that you use difficult situations to bring more and more people to you, God. Lord, we love you. We need you. We praise you, God. And we thank you, Lord, that you offer us the ultimate solution. In Jesus' name, amen.